Hello everyone and welcome to this talk called 10 lessons learned from 10 years on SRE, in 10 years on SRE. Uh, my name is Andreas Padaccini. I'm a principal software engineer in uh, SRE. I work on, on Azure uh, SRE. Uh, specifically, I'm on call for um, Azure Resource Manager, which is the entry point for all of the Azure control plane operations or most of them. And um, in, the, in the past few years, couple of years, I've met um, multiple Microsoft customers who wanted to do SRE, uh, whatever that means. And I realized that the topics were often um, similar or the same. So I thought maybe you know putting those together um, may make a, a good talk for uh, an audience when there's people who care about starting uh, something in SRE, but also for people who care about you know doing SRE well if you want over time. So that's how I chose to structure the presentation. Uh, the first part will be about starting a SRE, uh, where I collected some of the lessons or tips I, I have for people starting a SRE. And the second part is about steady state SRE or how to keep um, you know, SRE teams uh, performing well, uh, according to what I've seen that works or uh, may not work. Why? Why would you, why am I here? Why would you uh, listen to me? Um, so the, the title says it, uh, it's 10 years of SRE. I thought it was a catchy uh, title. I apologize for the, for the clickbaity title, if you want. Uh, also, I forgot a note about the, the pictures in the, in the presentation. They're all from the from Office's stock images. So it's a bit uh, of laziness of my part, on my part, if you want. Uh, some of them may be cheesy, so I apologize for the bad jokes there. Um, in 2011, I started as an uh, intern in SRE uh, in Google. I was working on a team called Corpenge, and I, I had the, the opportunity to learn firsthand what SRE was. I didn't really know, and I joined the team uh, while I was really looking for a software engineering internship. And at the end of the internship, I was pretty much sold. I, I liked how the team was working. I wanted to learn more, to do more. Uh, so I applied for a full-time position in 2012, which I got, and that led to a seven-year-long uh, stint in Google, where I worked mostly in um, the ads stats team or related teams about processing the statistics for Google's ads. Uh, I joined as junior SRE again. I became senior in 2015, and I took on some management responsibilities, so I also have roughly think three years of uh, experience managing SRE teams. And I went back to working as an individual contributor in uh, ads. Uh, first, actually, in uh, I moved to cloud at the time. I worked one year in uh, GCP, and then I moved to Microsoft. Uh, in Microsoft, first, I joined as a, as a software engineer. But then I really I realized that even as a software engineer, I was doing the, the job of an embedded SRE, so I, I thought it would be best to just move to, to Azure SRE, which is where I am today. And uh, today I'm working as the tech lead for one of the two tech leads for all of um, Azure SRE, working on cross-team projects. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, service level objectives for, for Azure. So without any further ado, here is the first part of the talk about starting SRE. Um, that's um, whenever I, I talk to customers that want to do um, SRE, my first question is why? So why why do you want to do SRE? What's your goal? So that's the first lesson. Know what you want from SRE. Uh, SRE can be highly beneficial. I mean, we we are here, so we most likely know the benefits of SRE. Uh, I think, uh, in short, some of the benefits are. Uh, the ability to plan um, for reliability separately from the from having reliability be one of the things you have to prioritize with, within your product development, you know, roadmap or or planning. Um, being able to create a community of uh, people or teams who care about reliability, which will over time, you know, grow to be more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it is expensive. The, Team topology I'm most uh, familiar with is uh, having dedicated SRE teams for, for dev teams. So a low, uh, if you want to dev to SRE ratio, uh, maybe two to one, three to one, five to one, 
uh, again, it is expensive. Um, it's also it also adds complexity because there is more people that you need to plan for and you need to talk and talking takes time. Um, so I mean, it, it's great, but make sure you know what you're gonna get out of it. So write it down. Uh, also, if possible, uh, try to write down how you will measure success of an SRE, of the three organization or team. This may not be possible or may not be the right metric uh, in six months or a year when you do the measurements, but have a direction of where you want um, the teams to go, what you want to achieve, what kind of change you want to achieve. And this is a lesson I learned uh, the hard way. Uh, SRE teams are part of a larger uh, organization. Organizations have purposes. They usually are, exist to serve customers or to, to achieve other business goals. SRE must serve those business goals. Ultimately, in the end, they exist to, to improve uh, the company performance or uh, what we deliver to the customers, whatever is in the context. One thing I've seen go wrong is when an SRE team, maybe a very good one, uh, they start doing things, they learn about the stock and then they deliver value and they do good things and they develop opinions, of course, because we're very opinionated. And then we write a roadmap because that's what we do. We plan what we want to do. It's not about reactiveness, it's about proactiveness, but it may happen that this roadmap diverges too much from the product dev roadmap. And when that happens, it, it, it's not a good thing. Uh, you may erode the trust you have built. You may lose relevance. Uh, what you're doing may not be uh, compatible with, with what the product team will plan to is planning to do in the next planning cycle or whatever. So it may be wasted work. Um, so the, the suggestion I have here, and it's, it's a crucial one, establish feedback loops uh, between uh, product development and the SRE at all levels of the hierarchy, at the executive level, at the management level, at the engineer's level, of course, you have some of that, but make sure that there's bidirectional feedback loops so that you build alignment. This is something I learned recently. Uh, maybe the title is not the best expertise in matters. Um, what I mean here in the context where you're starting as a team, um, my experience is that journalists are great SREs, so people who can uh, who have large breadth of knowledge and can speak to many topics uh, authoritatively. Those people usually will have some depth, or a very often a very good depth of knowledge. So make sure that those teams, uh, like the depth of some of those people, is perfectly aligned with the with the technological stack. Uh, that the, the team is going to work with. Now we can really all learn uh, new things. That's one of the things we usually like, but having someone who knows how the technology works well, and I mean, you know, not just the programming language, but because that can be learned, but how the language works in production, the runtime, the virtual machines, um, the frameworks, the, the pipelines, just make sure that you have people that know that environment well, because those will lift the other journalists that you that you hire for your team and, and will, they will accelerate delivery uh, of the team. You cannot declare a three. You cannot, just because you have a time target, so you, you a deadline, so you say, you know, in six months, you will establish a three. Uh, you may have a three teams, but Introducing SRE is a cultural change. Uh, it's not just technology, it's not just metrics. It takes time to implement SRE transitions. You don't expect success in a short time frame. So how do you, um, if time is not sufficient, how do you judge success? One way is to measure progress towards stated goals. So if when you started, you said, I want to achieve X, and uh, now some time has passed and you think you're done, like, did you, how do you compare with the goals you've stated previously? If you have metrics uh, for success, like you, you can measure those. Uh, there's also other proxies of success. So small things you may have not written down, but that I think are useful to understand where the, where the team is sitting. So how does the product development team interact with the three teams? 
Um, do we have that they share code reviews? Do they meet without managers? Uh, do they do design reviews? Is there shared work and collaboration? That's a good sign you know, of a cultural transition having happened or happening. What kind of projects does this routine do? Do they do small things on the side that are not crucial to the product or do they do things that matter? Are they moving up if you want in the Dickerson hierarchy with the kind of projects they take? Are they broad? Do they review uh, them with the dev team and so on? If you're establishing a large organization, is there a community? Are the, is this a collection of teams working independently with different parts of the organization or the division, or do they share uh, knowledge? Do they learn together? Do they, do they develop best practices together? Uh, so the, the value of a SME organization is greater than the sum of the value of the single engagement. Something, um, something I think must emerge uh, to, to truly realize the power uh, and the potential of an SME org. Of course, if you me are you measuring and improving your service reliability? That's kind of the, uh, the, the top level uh, goal. I think I touched a bit on this. Like the, there is, um, there is no SRE uh, without uh, shared ownership, and th there is no shared ownership if there is no trust. The trust is the um, trust is vital. It's crucial. Trust is the foundation of success of SRE uh, because of its complex nature of its, uh, its uh, non-trivial topology. Um, there has to be uh, trust at every level of the organization. And what do I mean at every level? Um, executives, uh, at some point, you will have gained trust or at least uh, uh, in the form of funding so that you, you will have funded the SRE organization or the SRE team, so the trust is there, of course. Um, uh, at the engineering manager level, this is a crucial level for, for trust to be built because um, teams have junior members on both sides uh, and junior people may or may not know uh, what SRE is. They, I mean, they have a sign up for S3 teams, much like what I did when I was an intern, I didn't really understand that. You really need to experience a bit of it to, to learn it, I think. So the, they will look up to their managers or to their senior peers. Those senior peers need to have built this kind of trust between the product dev and the SRE org to show, um, to, to, to explain how this is supposed to work. And uh, you know, in the case of developers, you know, the SRE team has these duties and they make these changes and you, you can ask them about these kind of topics, like their team members, like removing the barrier between teams is crucial at the uh, management level, and of course at the engineering level, how how do you how do you establish trust? Uh, it is not easy. I, I have I have two suggestions here. The first one is again alignment, as I mentioned earlier, and advocacy. So um, senior team members, managers, make sure you you go out of your way to and reach out to people to explain what the CRT does. Um, show what the teams achieve um, and how, how can this uh, be done? Uh, again, there's, there's this feedback loop uh, that I mentioned earlier about the, what does the S3 team do and can the dev team you know, um, have a say on this, vice versa. So establish review rituals, design reviews, um, code reviews among the two teams, uh, roadmap reviews, and so on. Because knowing what the other is going to do or deliver and seeing that happen uh, builds trust. The other thing which is more um, concrete uh, is about what you deliver. Uh, and I have another bit on delivery later, but make sure that you deliver complete and over time, larger and more impactful pieces of impactful work. Uh, those have to be complete, they have to be visible, make them visible, measure success, and show what the SV team or organization does for the product and ultimately for the business. That will lead to trust into the SV team. The second part of the talk, which is about um, steady state SV uh, setup tips about uh, teams that are already um, working, established, and 
how can they keep being successful or how can maybe they become successful? I touched on this bit uh, earlier. Finish what you start. And, and that's, that's a very common um, trap if you want. It is hard to stay focused. Um, we, by virtue of what we, we do, uh, we're in a complex environment, interacting with the production that changes and breaks all the time. Uh, we constantly get inputs from other teams and, and, and the technology and the systems itself. Uh, we are in an environment that's rich of opportunities by definition and by design. The other reason why it may be harder to finish what we start is that we may overestimate the project capacity. Again, we do some operational duties and those take time and doing them well with follow-up takes even more time. Uh, so that may erode our project capacity. One thing I've seen go not so well is eternal project. So you have this project that's there. I'm talking about a software project in this case that just lingers, just is something that keeps being deprioritized and it will done the next iteration and next quarter, semester, whatever, because there's more important things. You keep reacting to the, to the inputs, but you abandon that project. Maybe it's just not important anymore. It's something you thought was important, and, and it is not, you realize it is not uh, because the, the goals changed or whatever. So what do we do if the current projects, and at this point I'm talking about software projects or activities, uh, things that the team has to do, if they're not the best way to spend their time. If it's an internal thing only, I mean, within SOE, we decide we will develop a tool and then it's not the best use of our time, just cancel it. Just say, we will not do that, move on. Uh, if you have no external stakeholders, you have full control over your time. This may lead to unhappiness. Uh, so plan it, of course, uh, but it may be the best decision. If you have other stakeholders, especially uh, in other teams, this needs to be negotiated, uh, especially now if we move from the realm of software projects to you know activities or operational duties. Uh, are they the best way to spend their time now and in the foreseeable future? If not, just negotiate, uh, plan your exit, uh, manage expectations. Come with a business case about what you want to do instead is actually the better thing to do and, and try to get the team out of, of that commitment without breaking trust and just stop to do the thing because it is not um, the best way to manage that. We have to invest the very limited time that by the scientists series have into successful and meaningful projects and programs aligned with the three uh, mission and goals. This is an opinion of mine, which may not be shared by everyone, um, but I caution you against SRE services. Um, I've seen these not go well when you have SRE owned services that are critically understaffed and are not really, and end up being um, on the um, critical path for production services, but have no dedicated staffing. Now, here's an example. So imagine that your SRE team uh, finds a gap in a production software or platform or service, and they, you know, they, the SRE team is composed by brilliant engineers and they can create, you know, tool that can allow you to work around the limitation. And that's great. So you unlock, you unlock your, your partners, you create this tool, then the tool evolves into a service. Now, again, we are SREs, we, we know how, or supposedly we know how services run and are developed. So we build monitoring, observability, dashboards, uh, maybe even a CLOs. We take some time and do this quickly because it's a greenfield project. Everyone is excited. We create the service, great, and it works for us. Another team find, has, finds the same limitation because there is a platform gap and, the, and the, they find their service, the user service, great. Now they have a feature request, but you've actually, you know, you kind of moved on, the thing works for you. You don't have time for the feature request. They find a bug. Uh, you have to fix the bug, but this is gonna take time from your current projects. So you have to find one person to fix the bugs because you know, you, you've got another user and another use case and you get pressure to get it changed. I mean, it's not going well, it's not stuffed. And what if it breaks at night, whatever night means? Do you have an on-call rotation? It's, 
uh, you need you need services need proper staffing and this is just a hidden cost that needs to be made explicit and it's unfair to the three team uh, in this you know in this fictional fi fictional sorry in this fictional uh, context it's unfair to the three team to have them pay this cost so if there is a uh, what I suggest is that if there is a specific platform gap that you identify, uh, influence the platform so that it is fixed for everyone. And that may mean doing direct contributions, like loan an engineer that wants to do that, uh, you know, have the team work in collaboration with the platform team to develop the fix or the new feature, the new capability. Like you can do that. It isn't, it's a clear contract that you have there. And if you can establish that, it's great. If a new platform is really needed, uh, seek for, oh, I think I'm missing something. Okay, seek for funding, like find appropriate funding, um, either within your org or outside the org. If the people in your team are motivated to get that fixed, like have them, let them go, uh, have them, or go and start your, uh, this new service because it's a, it's a real need and existing platform doesn't want to meet that need. If, if the business needs that, it's a good investment, right? But has to be, I think the key point has to be an explicit investment. Um, think twice before accidentally creating a not supported critical production service. Another uh, opinion um, point, if you want, be wary of scaling SRE. What does, what does a scaling SRE mean? I mean, when SRE teams are successful, the, the org usually or sometimes uh, wants more of that. That can be achieved in many, in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, having a consultation model or adding more services to a team and growing the team and so on. So whatever you do uh, when you're scaling SME, uh, my suggestion is do not, that's a lot of words, uh, do not disrupt the contact surface with the production environment. But, and what do I mean by that? If you get consultations, office hours, uh, and have people that do this so that you can serve a broader set of services, people, teams. Um, I think one of the strengths of SRE in general is that their opinions are informed by current knowledge about the um, production environment in the company. So if, if those people don't get the time to experience production and have the, that learned production experience, the hard won learned production experience that is current, um, they may fall into uh, giving well reasoned but generic advice. You know, the, the, the infrastructure changes, the production platform changes, they have to have the time to, to keep being informed uh, about production. Do not overreach. Uh, don't expect that adding headcount or funding to an SRE team uh, magically makes them, you know, makes the SRE team, you know, twice. The, um, if you double the funding, you double the, the, the capacity. It takes time uh, to grow a team in general. So if you overload a team and you stretch the team too thin, it will not perform as well as it was before. Um, some ways it may work, uh, some ways scaling sublinearly may work. Um, have SRE, and that's one thing I, I love when it happens, and that's what I mentioned earlier, have SRE influence the internal production platform. When you have like platform teams and SRE, um, SRE is usually a set of power users for the production platform. Like they know, they know the platform, the monitoring, the incident management, the release uh, management, the, the build system inside out. The, they're, they're the experts and the most uh, interested users. So that they can influence the platform um, for the greater good if you want. Um, if you want to think about like consultative models or embedding a series, but always keep those series in touch with production. Stay humble. Uh, that this is key. Uh, I think I'll just read this slide. So SREs by necessity are excellent engineers. Imagine having people that need to be 
active when they waking up uh waking up uh 6 7 a.m and they have to 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 just understand uh Parts of the code that did not write, but that they understand very well to find the problem and mitigate the incident. SREs by trade develop key knowledge and skills. Again, managing incidents, um, developing in multiple languages and multiple platforms, talking to people, um, um, instrumenting services, and so on. SREs by design are in a complex environment and work across teams, so they have to learn. Uh, invest in their communication skills, learn how to persuade, negotiate, um, all those nice things. Um, therefore, SRE may, may develop a tiny bit of hubris and arrogance. Um, I have seen this. Um, me saying this might be ironic because I'm telling you all what to do, which I may or may not be qualified to do, but anyway, um, Arrogance is never uh, never productive. It's essential that we stay humble. Um, and humility also, I mean, lack of humility inhibits curiosity. That's also self-serving. If you're not humble, you're not curious because you think you know it all and you're limiting yourself in addition to making a disservice to the rest of the people on earth. Um, so keep asking questions. Uh, that's what we're paid to do in addition to write code or deleting code uh, with respect, an open mind and positive attitude. I think this is a very um, important slide for, uh, for people. We're almost at the end. Um, I hope the recording worked. Um, talk. Again, a very generic suggestion, talk more. Um, we all have interesting problems to work on and we may think that just working on the problem in isolation is the best way to rock it. It's not always, um, I mean, we need that kind of work, but we really, we really need to um, work on collaboration. Our profession relies on collaboration. Um, Rarely our work can be reduced to just a technical activity. So share problems and solutions within SRE to make SRE actually um, more than the sum of its parts uh, and grow this SRE function within an organization. And uh, you may find that someone just already fixed that or knows how to fix that without in you investing three weeks on that. Invest heavily in your network. Uh, your network brings you knowledge, skills, uh, opportunities, everything really. Uh, just talk more, talk to people. Uh, and that's how one of the things I like about SRE, people uh, with a very diverse background and you have all sorts of fascinating conversations, not just technical, just go and talk to your peers and to your counterparts and have fun. Thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Andrea Spadaccini. You can reach me out at andrea.spadaccini at gmail or microsoft.com. Uh, and I am Lupino Trem on GitHub and Twitter. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope I could answer your questions on the, on the Slack while I was talking in this recording. <laughs>